Hi, my name is Taylor Griffin, and you're listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. You're listening to Root of Conflict, a podcast about violent conflict around the world and the people, societies, and policy issues it affects. In this series, you'll hear from experts and practitioners who conduct research, implement programs, and use data analysis to address some of the most pressing challenges facing our world. Root of Conflict is produced by UC3P in collaboration with the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, a research institute housed within the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. I'm Sonnet Frisbee. And I'm Wangi Thuita. And you're listening to Root of Conflict. So our guest today was Cindy Wong, the Vice President of Strategic Outreach at Refugees International. She's also a visiting fellow at the Center for Global Development. Uh, she develops and leads initiatives to build support uh, for improved protection for refugees and displaced people in the United States, but also around the world. So she really has uh, a vast depository of experience on these issues. She also has been a senior executive in government uh, and, of course, nonprofit, and has led major policy initiatives on forced displacement, food security, and conflict prevention. While she was in government, she served as the deputy vice president for sector operations at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, but also a director of policy uh, of the State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations uh, and a senior advisor at the State Department. So she really has a lot of experience, um, had a lot of what I thought were fresh, uh, different insights and real evidence-based policy proposals related to refugees. So, Wangi, I'm really excited about the guests that we have on today. Um, Listening to the news in the last few years, you probably have heard about the refugee crisis. 70.8 million people, more than the population of Thailand, displaced by war, conflict, and persecution. Tens of millions more displaced by climate events and natural disasters. And, of course, it's a human issue, uh, but it's also a political issue with governments either capitalizing Uh, on it as a wedge issue with voters or struggling with how they should respond on a humanitarian basis. And there's a lot of misperceptions about refugees. And one of those misperceptions about refugees is that they're going to be in a host country for a short while and then go back home. But increasingly, we're seeing that protracted periods of displacement are becoming more common. And another thing is that, you know, living in a developed country as we do, we may be tempted to think that hosting refugees is a is a rich world issue, but the burden has mostly been shouldered by low and middle income countries like Uganda and Ethiopia, Bangladesh and Jordan and Lebanon. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Mwangi. And not only do we often think that the rich world is shouldering uh, the majority of the burden in terms of numbers, um, but also we think of the, the, the wealthy world, in particular the United States, as being a real leader in this area. Uh, and it's true that the U.S. used to accept, I, I think um, it was more than all other countries combined, um, which is no longer the case. But it's also instructive if you look at it in, in relative terms to population. And those trends are really shifting. So our guest talked uh, quite a bit to that point. Another thing that she mentioned that I thought was interesting was that 40 percent of displaced people today are actually IDPs. That's internally displaced persons. And that means that they're not subject to international conventions and protocols that were designed to protect refugees, who are people who've sought sanctuary in a different country. So I think the issue of internally displaced people is something that listeners will benefit from hearing about. We also solicited her advice for aspiring development professionals and future managers in nonprofit and government. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. We're really excited to talk to you. So as we mentioned, uh, currently 70.8 million people um, are displaced by war, conflict, and persecution. Can you contextualize that number for us in terms of the last 100 years or so, uh, maybe some of the bigger trends? And how does that look different today from 100 years ago? Yeah, the number has been on the rise. Um, and so you'll often hear, and it's the case, that this is the largest number of displaced people. At the same time, you know, it's important to then get down to the next level of detail where more than 40 million of those people are internally displaced in their own countries and about 25 million plus have fled to another country. 
Another piece of information that's really important is the absolute number compared with the global population. And so there have been times in history, I think we're kind of reaching parity with the level of displacement, for example, Hmm. after World War II as a percentage of population. You know, I will say that it's, it's important to think about those absolute numbers. At the same time, we also know that it's almost less about the numbers and more about our approach to including refugees. Because sometimes people hear the number and they feel really overwhelmed and think about what we can do. But there have been times um, where we have accepted globally a large number of refugees without the negative political backlash that we're seeing today. Hmm. And what are some common misperceptions about refugees and displaced people? And I mean that both on the part of policymakers and, let's say, the public, the average Joe. So one of the misperceptions is that people flee and after, you know, one or a couple of years, they're able to return home. But the average length of displacement is 10 years. And for those people who are displaced displaced in protracted situations for five years or more, they're displaced for more like 20 years. And I think for, that makes a huge difference, I think, both from the perspective perspective of the public and policymakers, which means that a lot of the solutions that we've come up with, like providing food, water, and shelter for refugees, you know, that makes sense if they're displaced for a short period of time. But think about 10, 20, 30 years, you know, we need more sustainable solutions. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I think one of the misconceptions that I've heard is often that, well, they don't actually want to go home and they're actually economic migrants. And during the recent refugee crisis in the EU, for example, there was a lot of conflating of economic migration and refugees. So I'd be interested to to hear um, how you describe the distinction between the two? And then how should the policies be differentiated for the Mm -hmm. two groups? Yes. So, you know, for refugees who they are fleeing violence, war and persecution, you know, there's it it is and we have international protocols um, to, to deal with them. And so I think it is important to separate them from economic migrants who may also be fleeing circumstances that are very dire, but at the same time aren't suffering from that same level of um, of kind of lack of safety. Um, and, and that really is what the international protection regime is about. From a policy perspective, You know, I I think that means that we do have to be clear that that system for seeking asylum and providing refugee protection is really critical. At the same time, I am, you know, I understand that some of the confusion in the public mind because there are cases of people who seek asylum who they, they don't win their case. You know, it turns out that they were trying to use a channel that they don't qualify for. And to be able to run, I think, People have a lot of empathy for refugees, and I think the issue is that we need systems that are transparent and function well. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what do you see um, as the United States' role in the refugee process? Um, I know a few years ago, um, I would hear it often touted that we accepted more refugees than any other country. Um, But I know that that was only in absolute terms since we already talked about absolute uh, versus proportion. So how do you see the U.S.'s role? Historically, the U.S. has anchored the refugee resettlement process. And for those of your listeners who aren't as familiar with refugee resettlement, those are refugees who have fled to another country and they aren't able to find safety in their new host country. And therefore, UNHCR and a system identifies them for resettlement settlement to a third country like the United States or Canada or the UK. Historically, um, you know, we used to resettle as many refugees as the rest of the world combined. And so it was a very big commitment. However, more recently, Canada has accepted more refugees than the United States. Canada, as we were discussing, is a much smaller country. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, the role of the U.S. has been not only in accepting refugees, but really in upholding the principles of international protection. And as we've seen those that seen U.S. leadership roll back, you know, we are seeing a 
global retrenchment of support for these principles. And it's not always only up to the U.S., but we were an anchor of that system. So do you mention the principles of international protection of refugees? And it strikes me that you also mentioned uh, inter- internally displaced people, IDPs, a moment ago. So I, can you talk about where IDPs maybe fall through the cracks in uh, in that system and perhaps where maybe they have advantages? I'd be interested in how those groups differ. Mm-hmm. So, for, and, and of course, the situations between various refugees and IDPs differ among themselves. So it's really important to have responses that are locally contextualized. It is very different because um, in terms of legal status in particular. So I work a lot on access to jobs for refugees. And once you've crossed a border, it's really, it, it you know, you, you are facing a lot of constraints where host countries don't allow refugees to work. If you're an IDP, you know, you're still a citizen of that country. So in theory, you still have access to services and access to jobs. In practice, oftentimes people who are displaced internally don't have that access. So I would say I think it's while there are significant differences, I think it's important to also look at the practical barriers that people are facing, whether they're IDPs or refugees, and try to overcome them. I'll just put in one final plug for there's a new high-level panel of the UN that's looking at IDPs. And we all can be rightly skeptical of high-level panels and what is implemented at the end of the process. However, I do see it as a very positive sign of the attention that's being paid to the unique situation of IDPs and what more the international community can do. And uh, you just spoke about labor market access. So I'd like to talk to you more about that and about some other policies that benefit refugees and how you at Refugees International approach uh, measuring the evidence for the success of policies. So living in a Western country, as we do, uh, with a constant stream of news about refugees over the last few years, you would think that uh, most refugees and displaced people are actively seeking sanctuary in Europe or North America. But um, as we know, uh, most of these people actually end up in uh, low and middle income countries in the Middle East, in Africa and Asia. And these countries face significant challenges in providing resources. Um, some of these challenges are material, some of them are political. Um, there's a fear in many of these countries that allowing refugees to work or have an education uh, or even allowing them access to national safety nets act, will act as a pull factor and lead to more refugees who will stay for longer periods of time. What does the, the research actually say uh, about these concerns? So, as you noted, the vast majority of refugees live in other developing countries, and that figure right now is around 85%. So it's really important to challenge some of the misperceptions misperceptions also about kind of who is doing what in this world around refugee protection. The evidence, I I will say that the evidence generation around the sets of questions that you asked is relatively new. um, And I think it's great now we have new actors like the World Bank starting to dig into these questions. You know, my understanding and assessment of the evidence is that you know, when people are first displaced, those policy conditions that you talked about, like, oh, can I have access to the social safety net system? Can I get an education? When they're fleeing violence, war, and persecution, people are not really carefully weighing those factors, you know, because, you know, I most recently did a study in Bangladesh, and, you know, the Rohingya were fleeing massive war crimes, and that that wasn't really a factor. Um, so I think it does depend on the various push and pull factors that are in place. You know, I, I think we have evidence from a number of cases that shows that that other policies beyond the kinds of benefits you can get are far more influential. So I mentioned some push factors like what people are fleeing from. Also, when countries, you know, close the border, you know, that's just has a, a much larger impact. So I think one other, as you said, uh, rightly, many governments are concerned about the pull factor. I've now in, in talking to government representatives around the world, I've heard more about the quote unquote stay factor, meaning that there's concern that by providing these services, refugees won't want to return, even when the conditions in their home country have improved. There is evidence around that that shows it really is mixed. You know, it depends on the policy conditions in both the hosting country and the country of origin. And 
there are examples of people who, when they have access to livelihoods, when they are.